Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Giovanni Carbone. I am head of the Africa program at ISPI. Uh, I will introduce and moderate uh, today's roundtable, which is part of ISPI's Med uh, Mediterranean Dialogues. Uh, the roundtable is entitled Between Africa and the Middle East, Geopolitical Competition in the Red Sea. We want to discuss the expanding connections between the two shores of the Red Sea, or even better, between the Middle East and the Greater Horn of Africa. Um, which, uh, which have uh, brought rising attention uh, to an area that has long been a geopolitical hotspot uh, and it's an area where several other global and emerging powers are also active. We want to better understand the nature of the growing links between uh, the with Middle East actors and Horn of Africa countries. Uh, so we invited three experts that I would like to introduce and welcome. They are Brandon Cannon, Assistant Professor at Khalifa University of Science and Technology, Hassan Kanenje, Director at Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies, and Camille Lons, Research Associate at International Institute for Strategic Studies. So thank you all for accepting our invitation uh, and uh, for contributing to the debate today. Um, we will have three rounds of interventions uh, by each speaker, each time uh, with individual five-minute an minute answers. Then we'll take questions from the audience, so please do write, uh, your, do ask your questions via our social, uh, via Facebook, via uh, YouTube, um, and we will um, have a look at them, of course, and, and try to uh, find, find time to answer them um, towards the end. I would like to start uh, with uh, Camille Lons, uh, with, a, with a, say, an introductory question. Uh, what are the principal drivers of uh, Gulf states' uh, projection in the Red Sea uh, and the Horn of Africa region? Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me, first thank of all. Um, this interest of Gulf states in the Horn is, is not really something new. Uh, they have a long-standing historical relations with the Horn of Africa. Uh, uh, but we're definitely seeing a comeback uh, uh, on the Red Sea and on the Horn of Africa of Gulf political agenda since about a decade or so. And uh, there are different drivers. Uh, there are, of course, uh, economic opportunities. Uh, the Red Sea is a, is a crucial trade corridor for them, uh, especially when getting access to European markets. Uh, it's, uh, there is the booming uh, consumer markets also in the Horn itself. Uh, Ethiopia, for example, had a, a double-digit uh, growth rate for almost 10 years uh, until a few years ago. Um, there is, of course, also the interest in uh, the agricultural lands. There are lots of uh, investments of Gulf countries in this uh, area, and they're very cautious of their food security, so it's very important for them. Uh, interest also in resources and raw materials like aluminum. Uh, the UAE is also uh, by far the largest importer of Sudanese gold, for example. Uh, but uh, beyond economic opportunities, there are also uh, some other factors, security dimension, of course, uh, with the piracy and maritime security issues in the area. Um, the Yemen war also has been like a compounding factor uh, with the need uh, for, for the, the countries in the Gulf, especially the UAE, to gain a military foothold uh, on that side of the, of the Red Sea. Um, but also, and probably most importantly, um, the Red Sea has re-emerged as an area of geopolitical context, contest and a uh, contest between regional powers. So uh, we've seen that Saudi Arabia and the UAE have been quite concerned by the influence of Iran. So uh, at the beginning, their, uh, their comeback to the, to the Horn was mainly focusing on, on countering Iran. And uh, in most recent years, it's been mostly uh, towards uh, countering the influence of Turkey and Qatar. And uh, this has been a very important driver for, for, for their influence in the Horn. Uh, but also more broadly, um, there is uh, a, a, an increase of, uh, you know, um, uh, great power politics uh, in, uh, in the area with China also and Russia entering the game. And so it is a, it is a, a geographic arena that is being increasingly seen as the prolongation of a broader strategic landscapes that includes also the Indian Ocean and, and the Asia Pacific. So for, for Gulf State, they're trying to regain control and influence um, in what they consider to be uh, uh, you know, their, their Western strategic flank. 
Uh, and also at a moment when the region itself is going through a lot of political transition. So, so they are trying to influence also the, these political uh, processes in the Horn. Uh, but just before finishing, I think it's important to note just that when I speak about Gulf states, uh, they actually uh, have different interests and sets of priorities. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, the Red Sea is really their direct neighborhood. Uh, it's, so it's a source of opportunities, but it's also a source of vulnerability. And so for them, it's very important to, to you know, uh, keep control over that area. While for the UAE and Qatar, it's more about positioning themselves outside of the Persian Gulf. Uh, it's uh, about uh, uh, gaining some influence. Also, it's, it's part of a broader strategy for the smaller Gulf states to, uh, to, to gain some influence and to hedge also against uh, bigger powers that are the neighbors, uh, especially Saudi Arabia. And so even if we tend to see that the Saudis' interest and the UAE's interest tend to uh, align uh, in, uh, in the Horn of Africa, they still have some uh, different strategic interests. And, and sometimes also the Saudis have been a bit annoyed of seeing the, the Emirates getting more um, more influence in, in that area that they consider as being their, their strategic uh, backyard. Uh, so, so I think overall, uh, what is important to, to note for Gulf states drivers is this evolution of the security architecture in, in the Gulf and in the broader region with the U.S. withdrawing and with this, you know, this attempt by Gulf states to have more assertive foreign policies and try to reinforce their strategic autonomy. And I think the projection of influence in the, in the Horn of Africa is part uh, of this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, for um, giving us this, the broad picture of the area. I would like to uh, bring to, um, one of the, one of, to, uh, to tell us something about one of the issues that Camille touched upon. You, you, you talked about uh, the rivalries. We are uh, well aware of the different axes, uh, Turkey and Qatar uh, versus Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. But what is the impact of uh, these um, rivalries on the Horn of Africa and on the alliances um, with and among uh, the regional actors there? Brandon. Thank you very much. It's a good question. Um, a lot of this is seen uh, through the lens of the GCC crisis that began in 2017. And I think uh, Camille's right to point out that much of this engagement uh, began prior to that and has been ongoing for a, for a long time. And so in many respects, if we look at this only post-2017, there seems to be this incredible aspect of competition and strategy uh, um, ongoing, um, you know, with Middle Eastern powers, Turkey and Qatar on one hand, UAE and Saudi Arabia on the other in the Horn of Africa. And um, while that's true to a degree, um, and I think in some respects, some of the Gulf states leaders have bought into this viewpoint um, post-2017. The other aspect of this is that all along, whether it was Turkey's involvement that began in 2011, Qatar's uh, involvement in Somalia in particular beginning in 2006, et cetera, all of these involvements were done for reasons of domestic politics um, and, and regime interest in, in the countries I mentioned. Furthermore, they tended to dovetail uh, um, rather nicely with interests of ruling elites in the Horn of Africa state. So I think one of the big upshots of, of, of this engagement is actually the hitching of Middle East states' agendas to ongoing agendas across the horn. Um, there's a couple of different examples I can give you. Uh, Abiy Ahmed, uh, the current prime minister of Ethiopia, his uh, election a few years ago was supported um, by the UAE. That was a uh, pivotal um, um, according to my understanding, in his in his election, that was something, of course, that Abiy Ahmed was already doing for uh, uh, planning for years before that. Um, Farmajo's election, uh, the the uh, current president of of Somalia, albeit uh, to many illegitimate, um, his election in 2017 um, had something to do with 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 Qatari support and money, um, although uh, that was not the critical factor in his election. 
um, the peace accords between uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, in which Saudi Arabia and the UAE played a role. Uh, this obviously had something to do um, with an agenda of Abiy Ahmed and his cadre, um, and we now we can now see that playing out in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. So I think this rivalry, um, while extant, uh, has actually paid some dividends um, to leaders, at least in the Horn of Africa. Um, I, I don't want to extrapolate this too far and say everything's rosy because it certainly isn't. Um, but uh, I, I think we should point out some of the the connections, the push and pull uh, between Horn of Africa state leaders on the one hand and Middle East states and their leaders on the other and how their actions um, complement one another. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, you touched upon uh, the Horn of Africa countries and on Ethiopia. I would like to ask um, Hassan Kanan. Uh, of the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies, um, something more specific about Ethiopia. Ethiopia has no direct access to the sea, um, and but it, it is the the, the, the largest by uh, it's it's far uh, the, the largest country in the area. Uh, it's it's the Horn of Africa heavyweight essentially. How do uh, economic uh, developments such as uh, infrastructural projects uh, and political developments such as the Tigray War uh, impact upon Ethiopia's role uh, in the region and its relations with um, outside powers. Hassan, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea about 20 years ago it denied it access, you know, to the sea. And therefore, for much of the last two decades, it was a country that was struggling. Now, Djibouti has been able to provide that um, access. However, the recent events that we've seen, especially the conflict uh, in the Tigray region, has to a certain degree uh, reduced uh, Ethiopia's influence uh, in the region diplomatically and economically, in part because it has affected its economy greatly, uh, but at the same time, um, the kind of shine that Addis Ababa enjoyed for much of the last uh, uh, few years, uh, especially since uh, uh, the assumption of power by Abiy Ahmed, you know, has disappeared. Now, it's a country, the kind of moves it's making within the Horn region, it's uh, to allow it to have access uh, to that sea. So whether it's the Chinese build uh, railway with Djibouti, which of course accounts for Ethiopia's 90% of Ethiopia's uh, uh, import-export trade and 70% pretty much of the activity that goes on in the port of Djibouti, or uh, its kind of arrangement is having with Somaliland. It's a it, it, those, those kind of engagements are meant to allow it access because without that access, of course, it's problematic. Now, the desire to access the sea has also complicated things in Somalia, for instance. Uh, Ethiopia's opposition for instance, to some federal member states is also informed uh, by its desire, for instance, to have access to Kismai. Now, of course, that is challenging uh, because the emerging, what we call the tripartite arrangement between Somalia, mostly, of course, you know, Farmajo, Abi Ahmed and Eritrea, uh, the Tigray war and uh, the recent attempt uh, at uh, uh, constitutional extension of president's term has affected and has limited uh, the, the, the strength and the political power of that alliance. And so increasingly, uh, while in the recent past, in, uh, Ethiopia pretty much was uh, competing to, uh, with Kenya and Nairobi as a regional hegemon, uh, recent events have actually affected its ability to be able to project power to influence events, despite the size of, of the country being a very big country with more than 110 million people. And I think uh, what happens going forward, especially with regard to addressing the internal dynamics in the Tigray region and uh, uh, moving towards democracy and holding elections, and how the type of role they're going to play in Somalia are going to determine the place of uh, Ethiopia within the, the Horn of Africa, within the African continent at large. Thank you. Back to um, Brandon. Um, Brandon, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United uh, Arab Emirates um, played a role in brokering uh, the peace deal between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. 
Um, on the other hand, um, it appears that uh, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates um, arguably contributed to fueling instability in, in Somalia. How should we uh, consider, how should we look at uh, the involvement of Gulf, uh, Gulf countries in the region? Is it uh, predominantly an involvement that brings about more instability or does it have a potential for stabilizing a historically unstable region? Well, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to do a bit of fence sitting here, which is probably not wise in a forum like this, but I think it's, um, we, 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 see, we see both aspects of this. Um, uh, we see the Saudi Emirati uh, um, cooperation, uh, at least to a degree, in bringing about a peace deal um, that for all intents and purposes, um, when it was first mooted, uh, seemed to blindside um, Isaiah Safwerki, the, the president of uh, Eritrea. Um, uh, that ended up being a good thing on one hand for both Ethiopia and Eritrea, um, or at least the regimes in both countries, um, but a bad thing for the Tigray region of Ethiopia, which we now uh, see and the conflict that's ongoing there. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's a bit difficult to fall on one side of the fence or the other. In terms of, of Somalia, um, yeah, this has really been the ground zero of uh, um, UAE um, Qatari uh, play, um, particularly post 2017. Um, Farmaggio attempted to rather skillfully play off uh, both states, um, but given his close relations with Doha um, and particularly that of his uh, presidential advisor at the time, uh, Fahad Yassin who's now head of the National Intelligence Service, um, you know, he really couldn't shrug off Doha completely, and so he attempted to maintain a neutral stance. That angered um, the UAE, which took the hardest line of any GCC state against Qatar. Um, and this resulted in really the um, removal, uh, both by, um, by the Somali side, as well as um, withdrawal by the Emirati side of, of, of UAE presence in Mogadishu. Um, that included uh, training uh, camps and uh, aid for security services there that have been ongoing for about five years. Um, now, that has not ended necessarily the attempts to uh, rejigger the map, if you will, in Somalia. Um, the UAE has, in some respects, doubled down in uh, the independent, de facto independent, but internationally unrecognized Republic of Somaliland. Uh, Dubai's DP World, a major ports operator, um, they signed a deal, a tripartite deal with Ethiopia, the Republic of Somaliland, um, in, excuse me, Ethiopia, the Republic of Somaliland, and DP World signed a tripartite deal uh, five years ago for the expansion and refurbishment of the port of Berbera. That would assist um, the UA, excuse me, Ethiopia uh, get out of its landlocked. Uh, situation that Hassan just referred to. Um, that also at the time supposedly included a military base for the UAE, which was involved in Yemen at the time. That, to my understanding, has never um, actually occurred. However, uh, the UAE recently upgraded its the status of its representative to the Republic of Somaliland, certainly not to that of an ambassador. There's no international recognition by uh, the UAE but it was another poke in the eye um, uh, at Mogadishu um, aimed at to, to, to really express the UAE's displeasure with, with the ruling regime in Somalia. Um, so there's no doubt that I, I think the UAE sees a real problem overall in Mogadishu. Uh, uh, the Qatari influence um, uh, in the ruling class, at least with Farmaggio and his cadre, but also the bigger issue of, of Turkey's involvement there and the Turksong military base that trains the Somali National Army. Um, these issues or these occurrences, particularly the training of the Somali National Army by Turkey, um, really have uh, the possibility of, of overthrowing existing orders um, within Somalia itself. Uh, Hassan mentioned uh, the breakaway state of Jubaland. Of course, I've mentioned the Republic of Somaliland. And, all, and, and it's safe to say that many of the people 
in both places, Kismayo and Hargeisa, uh, respectively, are very fearful of what could occur should the SNA, the Somali National Army, grow stronger under the aegis of Turkey. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, Camille, Camille Lons uh, of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, back to you. A another important player in the area is Egypt. Um, to an extent, Egypt is aligned with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, but there are also issues, regional issues, on which uh, they don't fully agree. They don't have the same stance or positions. To what extent are they uh, cooperating as opposed to competing uh, over specific issues in the region? Well, it's a, it's a complex relationship uh, because uh, in general, beyond the, the, the Red Sea and the, and the Horn question, um, Egypt has been quite dependent financially from, from Gulf states. Um, between 2013 and 2016, for example, uh, they received about uh, $30 billion uh, from the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Uh, including uh, a series of central bank deposits and bailout packages. Um, the bulk of, his, of this aid came uh, after the Arab Spring, and there was a moment when Gulf countries were competing to influence the, the political process in, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, Egypt also receives a lot of uh, remittances from, from workers that were in the Gulf. So, so there is a, a, a very um, important uh, uh, relationship uh, and there, they have been because of that a bit politically tied uh, to to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, but at the same time, it's uh, it's a country that uh, remains very proud and that is conscious of itself as a regional power, and so it is reluctant to to get completely dictated by by Gulf states, and, and this uh, includes as well on on politics of the Horn. Um, because CC sees Egypt as a, as a it sees the Horn as a, a strategic backyard of Egypt, uh, and uh, he sees Horn dispute and especially the the Renaissance Dam issue as African issues. Um, and for example, uh, he's been quite annoyed by uh, by Gulf interference uh, in in the Horn, although he couldn't really necessarily like say it uh, officially, uh, but. Um, on the Red Sea Council that was set up by, by uh, Saudi Arabia uh, early uh, 2020, that was an initiative that was led by Egypt originally. There was an initial meeting in Cairo in December 2017, and the Saudis have retaken uh, uh, you know, uh, the lead on this, on this project, and they have also changed slightly the, 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 um, the orientation of the project to make it more strategic fo focused, security focused. And, and, uh, and the Egyptians feared that the, the Saudis would make it a, a tool of a, a Saudi influence in the region. And, um, and same thing for, for the GERD dispute. Uh, uh, they have been, I mean, uh, Egypt has been uh, seen a, a bit as a treason. Uh, uh, the fact that Gulf countries have been uh, more balanced than what he expected them to be. Uh, at the end of the day, officially, they have supported Egypt because they had to support Egypt on this issue with, uh, with Ethiopia. But they have close relations with Abiy Ahmed and um, they have proposed to, to mediate the dispute. But, but uh, and obviously as well, like uh, they have important uh, economic interests as well in seeing the, the GERD uh, being uh, uh, materialized because they have important uh, uh, investments in Sudan's uh, agricultural lands. So Egypt has been quite annoyed uh, by this. Uh, and from from uh, Gulf countries' perspective and from the Saudi and the UAE perspective, there's also the fact that Egypt is, of course, uh, an important uh, partner, uh, you know, a regional cornerstone of regional stability. But it has lost a little bit its uh, strategic importance for Gulf states. And sometimes it had become a bit more a burden than, a, than an opportunity. Uh, and, and their priorities have, have evolved uh, over recent, uh, recent years. So, so the, the relationship has been, uh, has been a bit tense. Um, but at the same time, yes, uh, Egypt cannot really do uh, differently. And uh, it has been trying also to obtain uh, still and, and cooperate with Gulf states on some of these issues. So 
on the Red Sea Council, for example, they have managed to obtain concessions from the Saudis in terms of excluding the, the Ethiopians from, uh, from the, the, the organization. The, um, they also have conducted some maritime exercises in the Red Sea with the Saudis and the, the Emirates. Uh, there was a, quite a good representation from these two countries uh, uh, when they launched the the, the Berenice Bays. Uh, so, but it's uh, it's definitely a, a complicated relationship uh, of both cooperation and, and competition in the Horn. Thank you, Camille. Uh, you touched upon a, a very crucial issue: the building of, of the Nile Dam. Uh, which is, uh, let me remind the audience, is this uh, big dam that Ethiopia is building in its own territory, uh, claiming full sovereignty about what they do uh, at home, uh, but it will affect inevitably the, the, the flow, uh, the downstream flow of water uh, through Sudan and, and uh, towards Egypt. And this, uh, this uh, created a, a very tough dispute that has been going on for quite some time, um, having to do uh, with control of the water flow, as well as the, with, the, with, with the timing of the filling of the, of the dam. Um, what, is, what is your take on this, Hassan? Um, how do you think that the, the dispute about the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam um, is affecting and will affect relations with the Gulf states, uh, within the region, uh, between Ethiopia and Egypt, because this really uh, is possibly today, um, you know, the, the, the issue that has the greatest potential for an, uh, an interstate clash uh, in, in, I would say, in the whole of Africa, possibly. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's true. Uh, the the Renaissance Dam is perhaps uh, one of uh, the most difficult questions and um, uh, potential causes of a wider conflict, uh, especially in the Horn of Africa, in the larger Horn of Africa uh, region. Now, you, you know, historically, uh, Egypt relies very heavily, if not almost exclusively, on the Nile. As they say, the Nile is Egypt and Egypt is Nile. Now, the trouble is most of the waters that get into the Nile come from Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, of course, is citing its sovereignty uh, rights to be able to use its own resources. Now, the challenge, of course, with that, it's, there is a chance that it may affect uh, the water flow uh, you know, to Egypt. And so that may affect the economy of Egypt. Now, within the region, this has complicated things. In fact, when you look even at uh, uh, the place of Gulf states, for instance, uh, the initial uh, approach of Gulf states was uh, an endorsement of the Egyptian position. The Arab League initially endorsed the Egyptian position. But at the same time, uh, you find Gulf states, uh, they're allying themselves with some players such as Abiy Ahmed. Now, uh, uh, within the region, you've, on this issue in particular, you find now Sudan is working very closely with Egypt. But Sudan is having a conflict with Ethiopia at the same time. Now, Egypt, uh, in, in recent days, has or rather weeks, has uh, conducted a lot of uh, what we call shuttle aggressive diplomacy uh, within uh, some countries of the Nile Basin and uh, is probably trying to uh, build some kind of cloud so it can be able to make a case uh, within the African Union and the United Nations Security Council uh, with regard to this question. But... Uh, this essentially, uh, while it is essentially an African problem, I do not think the efforts, you know, just going by the efforts have been made, of course, there was a failure in Washington, in part because of the perception that uh, President Trump wasn't fair. Uh, the South African effort, of course, also failed. And uh, absent of more robust international involvement, especially with regard to res uh, attempts to resolve this issue, I think the two countries are not are going to be unable to do that. Now, this is a, a very emotive and uh, nationalistic issue in Egypt. But at the same time, in Ethiopia, it is the single largest infrastructural inv investment, perhaps in the history of the country, that uh, holds potential, not just to Ethiopia, but, to, but uh, to supply power to neighboring countries. And so economically, it is something that is critical. But in the 
wake of the Tigray cri crisis conflict, uh, Abiy Ahmed is at his weakest. And at this stage, it's unlikely that he will be willing to make any concessions with regard to the dam. Now, on the other hand, uh, the, the Nile issue being a very a nationalistic, very, uh, in, uh, very sentimental, not, not sentimental, very nationalistic, but also very uh, economically very vital. Egyptians tend to see it as an existential threat, anything that uh, threatens to reduce the, 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 the waters of the Nile. And so uh, when, when you look at all these complexities that are taking place you, you know, around it and with, with no prospect or framework that is going to move the two countries closer to negotiation or closer to an agreement, uh, we are looking at a situation that is not exactly uh, uh, palatable or and it's not sustainable, so to speak. And those uh, of us especially who do an analysis and, uh, who in, in this region um, is going to require a more meaningful uh, intervention by the international community with sufficient carrots and sticks to force the parties to reach an agreement because the Egyptians today, they're not in a position to compromise, especially on the critical question of the length it takes to fill the dam. Now, the, on, on, on this other hand, the, Abiy Ahmed is very weak politically internally to be able to make a compromise on that front. And so that leaves us in a place that is not uh, very comfortable uh, as a region, and especially when it comes to the question of the, 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 the Renaissance Dam, because the African Union and EGAT's efforts have failed. Uh, the United States tried in isolation, of course, it failed. And so it's going to take something more than that and something more consistent, something sustained uh, in terms of effort and something deliberate to be able to bring the parties to some kind of an agreement. Because the previous treaties, of course, uh, with regard to the Nile, excluded most of the countries that are actually either the sources of the Nile or, the, or, or rather they're affected by the Nile. And I think that is where the, the, the emotional and uh, the, the existential issue comes about uh, because uh, the sense of exclusion uh, for many years since 1929, of course, and then 1959 treaties is one thing that is pushing, for instance, Ethiopia to decide or to insist that um, they will want to have a say in the use of their own waters and uh, Egypt should not be able to dictate how they're going to use that water. And so it's going to require, as I mentioned, more meaningful, more sustained intervention by the international community to be able to bring the parties together. Absent of that, I think it's going to be a crisis of uh, unspoken magnitude. Yes, son, but uh, Ethiopia has some key advantages uh, on this dispute, I mean, uh, one is the location of the dam, which is in Ethiopian territory, and that one is time. Uh, they have no incentive to find a solution. They, they can drag it on, uh, as, since they, their aim is to fill the dam, and they've started already. And, and also they can agree or not agree on whether uh, international mediators uh, could be involved, and they are so far rejecting uh, the involvement of additional international mediators over which they, they, they feel they cannot uh, uh, maybe uh, exert uh, enough influence. Do you see the potential there for uh, Egypt to actually um, uh, move to, to action? Yeah, I think Egypt has stated, and it seems to be keen, very keen on this, uh, that uh, they may take unilateral action against uh, the, the dam. Uh, or rather the construction. Now, that is a possibility. The, cha the, the challenge, if, if that happens, then uh, it's going to lose the kind of moral authority right now and claim that it has. And so it may actually lead to a backlash, especially from the Nile Basin countries. And so it may create a situation where even these countries try to sabotage the water uh, that's supposed to be going you know, to Egypt. And so it, it is a very risky, uh, action if Egypt were to, to decide unilaterally to go ahead. But based on, of course, the sentiments from Cairo is they are determined to do something to either uh, stop the construction, but in a way that is, is not going to, to create a backlash. And I think that is 
part of the reason why uh, uh, Cairo is trying to do uh, to undertake some shuttle diplomacy with a number of countries around the region. So in the event uh, that that happens, at least uh, it, perhaps they, they will hope that uh, the region will understand the Egyptian position and perhaps they will paint Ethiopia as the, as the bad guys. However, it's still a very complex and a very risky move to be able to undertake. And so ultimately, I think Egyptians will be better informed to work with other countries uh, within the continent, but especially also outside, with sufficient sticks and carrots to be able to bring both parties to, to bear. Because even Egypt will have to make compromises, just as much as Ethiopia will have to make compromises on that. But without sticks and carrots to bring to these parties, it's going to be uh, very difficult to reach some kind of, a, of an agreement. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, let's move for a moment uh, to the other side of the Red Sea. Uh, there's, a, there's a conflict there, of course, the, the, the conflict in Yemen. Um, what is the impact of this conflict um, on the region and on the relationship between uh, Middle Eastern powers and Horn of Africa countries? Brandon, um, can you tell us something about this? Uh, it has been tragic. Frankly speaking, it has been tragic. Um, it has made sorry, the sorry, problem. Sorry, Hassan, Hassan may, I, may I interrupt you? I, 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 just to uh, make sure we have uh, some time for the others as well. I, I wanted to ask this to Brandon, oh. sorry. Oh, oh thanks. Okay. Sure, oh, sorry. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the impact, I, I assume you're asking about the impact of the, of the ongoing conflict in Yemen and the Horn. Um, and that uh, has, has been um, quite interesting in that it, it really did bring uh, certainly further Emirati involvement in the Horn. Um, you know, Post-2015 with the Saudi-led coalition that, that um, uh, entered the, the conflict in Yemen, uh, this really was the genesis, um, for example, of uh, Emirati uh, rapprochement or at least um, negotiations with Eritrea for the opening of the Assab naval base, um, as well as the uh, airstrip there. And that was a major focus of their operations and resupply uh, in Yemen. Now, uh, that um, was critical. Uh, there, was, there were issues as well um, that have been reported uh, about the usage of mercenaries, um, primarily from Sudan, the Port Sudan region. Um, by the warring parties. So that's also had an impact. I think this is part of what Hassan began to say, rightly so, was, um, has, has been quite catastrophic. You have um, a situation in a place like Hargeisa that I saw in 2018, um, when uh, you had initially Somalilander refugees that had gone to Yemen to um, flee the situation in, uh, uh, in, in Somalia, particularly after the um, uh, 19, beginning of the 1988 uh, civil war, um, they ended up coming back to Somaliland and were refugees again in their own country. Um, you had a lot of Yemenis also uh, going across the uh, Gulf of Yemen to um, Somaliland, uh, to Djibouti, um, et cetera. And so that's been, that's been quite uh, um, disastrous as far as those societies are concerned as well. Um, Beyond that, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, the the Yemen crisis, uh, I think, added fuel to this fire that led to the GCC crisis, um, and, and that in turn had its impact across the Horn of Africa. Um, but the the flip side of this, or maybe the good side, as I as I mentioned in my first comment, um, or I referred to in my first comment, is the rapprochement between Eritrea and Ethiopia that occurred, um, partially, I would say, as a result to uh, Saudi and Emirati engagement with um, the regime in, um, in Eritrea, uh, which had been quite isolated. Uh, and so this um, allowed them, I would assume, the, the, the amount of leverage uh, needed to, to push or at least um, convince uh, President Afwerki that the peace deal with Ethiopia um, was possibly in his best interest. Uh, as it turns out, of course, Afwerki um, grasped at that, and we can see the results um, um, between uh, the movements in, in, in Tigray there. So that would that would that's what I would say would be the major 
results of, of the Yemen crisis um, in the Horn of Africa. More engagement, um, uh, particularly by Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the Horn, uh, which if we look at the entire picture is not always rosy, but not always doom and gloom either. Brendan, let's try to expand uh, even more the picture. Um, Camille, uh, among um, foreign powers involved in the region, there's not just uh, Middle Eastern powers, but of course there's, there's many others, among them China. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, sees the Horn of Africa as a strategic, and, and, and the, the Red Sea as a, a, strategic, a strategic area and, and, and route. Uh, what are the, the main interests and the, the, the kind of presence that Beijing uh, has been developing in the area? So yes, definitely. I mean, China is, is a major player in the horn. Uh, on the economic side, it, it has even greater weight than than uh, than uh, Gulf countries. And uh, even if it's in terms of investment, if it, even if, if on Beijing side, it remains a, a drop of, of its uh, uh, investments uh, in, in the world. On the side of, uh, of horn countries, uh, who are you know struggling to to get access to international funding and and to uh, and to get some uh, some investments? This represents uh, a, a real. Uh, this can have really like a real geoeconomic impact. Um, and so, in terms of the drivers for Beijing's interest uh, interest in the region, um, they're mainly economic. Uh, it's again, it's a bit like for the the Gulf states. There's the fact that the Red Sea is a it's a major maritime trade route uh, that connects. Uh, to markets in Europe, so it's it's extremely important for uh, for the BRI. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the, the region is very rich in terms of natural resources, so minerals, crude oil. Um, Sudan, for example, was uh, for a long time a very uh, important source of uh, oil for China. Uh, it was about like seven percent of its total oil imports uh, until 2011. Um, although that element of uh, the energy element has reduced a bit uh, over the past 10 years because uh, there has been like security factors, but also the fact that China has been diversifying its, uh, its provision of uh, energy. And so the region has become a bit less important for China, but it's, it's still quite important. Um, there is obviously the, the fact that it's an entry door to African markets. Uh, again, uh, countries with booming populations, um, a lot of opportunities for Chinese uh, construction companies, for example, um, in, the, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they have undertaken a number of projects like the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, for example, although this one is a bit controversial, um, the port of Djibouti, etc. So, so a lot of interest for China as well, like in terms of uh, digital infrastructures as well, uh, which is something that we talk uh, usually a bit less about, but uh, Huawei has built over 70% of, uh, of the 4G networks uh, across Africa. Uh, so, so yeah, lots of uh, economic opportunities, uh, quite a very asymmetrical relationship uh, with the region. Uh, but uh, the drivers are not only economic, and there are also some strategic drivers that are becoming more important. Um, so the fact that China has established a base in Djibouti and that it is, it is expanding it uh, over time, uh, it is increasingly also considering the Red Sea as, you know, and, and the Red Sea and the Western Indian Ocean as a, a kind of continuation of, of the Indian uh, Ocean and the Asia Pacific as a strategic space. Uh, and without necessarily trying to become a security player uh, in the region, uh, because they're, they're quite happy with letting the, the U.S. bear the, the security burden. Uh, but it's a way to gradually gain experience, you know, in overseas missions like the rescue operation from Yemen or, or the base in Djibouti. Uh, it's a way to, yeah, to gain experience, uh, to boost their credentials as a, a global power. Uh, it's a way also in the case of the, of the base in Djibouti to collect some intelligence on other bases uh, because... Uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, international, um, I mean, uh, bases from different uh, countries uh, gathered in Djibouti. It's one of the most militarized regions in the world. And so for the Chinese having a foothold in this area 
is a very good way to monitor also what other powers are doing. Um, and uh, as we were talking also about uh, intelligence uh, gathering, uh, there are also like the fact that, for example, in Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia uh, hosts the, the African Union headquarters uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, and there was this case, for example, of uh, the data theft or allegations of data theft by, by China uh, on the AU uh, headquarters in Addis, where Huawei was uh, in charge of the IT infrastructure. Uh, so it's, it's a region where a lot of things happen. And so for, for Beijing, having a presence there is quite uh, useful. Um, and um, it's also a way, I mean, the more they're present in the Red Sea, the more they force the US to focus a bit more on the Red Sea and the less uh, the US is going to have capacities to focus more on, on the South China Sea or on the Asia Pacific at large. So, so that's also one of the you know, general rationals. And um, overall, there is also the question of gaining geoeconomic leverage. Uh, the fact that a lot of these countries uh, who are you know, cash strapped, uh, who are uh, having difficulties to access uh, uh, financing, international financing, uh, and that are extremely dependent then on, on Chinese financing. This is uh, giving some leverage uh, uh, to China to try to influence uh, uh, some of these uh, countries, for example, in the support that they give uh, in international forums. On, on, for example, the Uyghur issue is a very good uh, example. Almost all the, the, the countries in the Horn of Africa, uh, I think with the exception of Ethiopia, have signed this open letter on uh, for the UN on Xinjiang, for example. Uh, a, a number of them as well uh, have supported China uh, on the July 2016 uh, arbitration on South China Sea. So these are, you know, uh, interesting elements uh, uh, to to watch on how China slowly is also uh, leveraging some of these uh, geoeconomic presence. To, uh, in different countries and including in the Horn of Africa to, uh, to, to, to support its own uh, political interests in other uh, theaters. Thank you, Camille. Uh, and, and that's for China. Um, Russia is on, on a very different scale, um, possibly also has uh, interests in the region. I would like to hear from Hassan, um, about uh, Russia's efforts to uh, gain a presence in Sudan. Sudan is a country that we have only very briefly mentioned, but it's part, of course, of the Greater Horn of Africa. Uh, what kind of international competition, um, what kind of international presences are there uh, in Sudan, whether Russia or, or Turkey or what other countries are trying to exert uh, influence uh, over Sudan? Okay, thank you. Um, you are breaking a little bit. So I think, can you just repeat that last part, if you don't mind? To ask you what kind of uh, presence, external influences, uh, what kind of relations is Sudan developing with um, outside powers? Yeah, oh, and to, you had mentioned Russia. Um, now, well, yeah. I think based on even the discussion today, we know that, uh, you know, uh, the Horn of Africa has become the next theater of global geopolitics, especially when it comes to the global south. And the um, amount of competition we are seeing, of course, reflects and interest in the region reflects this uh, newfound status as uh, the th next theater for geopolitics. Now, um, Recently, of course, uh, Moscow announced its intention to set up a naval base in Sudan. Now, uh, I, I think it's important to understand uh, that Moscow's move is partly informed in the fact that I think uh, following the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, Russia had retreated back you know, to its borders. But increasingly, they are trying to look outward. Now, outside, of course, the Black Sea and uh, uh, Tatars in the port in, in Syria, Moscow does not have any other port, uh, you know, around the world, and especially on the continent. Now, Sudan serves as a critical part. Number one, it's right within the Horn of Africa. But number two, it can serve also as a forward base for its other activities, especially in the Central African Republic. Uh, number three, 
uh, Resurrection Federation is, the, is, is, the, is what we call the Johnny Come Late list. Uh, it's not part of uh, uh, that uh, uh, group of, of countries that already have a presence in Djibouti or have bases elsewhere. And so uh, they thought perhaps to have an arrangement with a country like Sudan was going to be helpful. And it's something that the previous president, al-Bashir, uh, had started discussions with. And so it was simply formalized, you know, in, in recent months. Now, Sudan is in, at a place that is not uh, uh, enviable uh, for many transitioning countries. Economically, it has suffered under sanctions. The transition right now is not going very, very well. And the reason I'm saying that because the, the transitional government that is set up, made up of both the military and the civilian, the military seems to be busy in trying striking certain deals with countries. Uh, a lot of times, to without considering the what the population actually thinks of the civilian uh, uh, rather uh, branch of that government. Now, for instance, uh, prior to the overthrow of Omar al Bashir. Um, we know that El Bashir had uh, decided, you know, for some time was dealing with uh, with Turkey, was dealing with uh, Qatar, was dealing with Iran, and immediately after his overthrow, we saw that leading Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, and uh, the Emirates uh, injected billions of dollars, pretty much overnight, and part of it was uh, to buy loyalty from the military uh, wing of the government, which of course is the most powerful. And most of the foreign policy today is being dictated by that. So when we look at the behavior of Sudan, we have to look at it within the prism of the power of the military within this transitional government. The challenge we have is whether the civilian government is going, that after the transitional period, is going to abide by some of the arrangements and the agreements that the military government has made. Now, the trouble for both the civilian, the military wing of the government, which is the Sudanese government, is both of them need resources. And so you find them working uh, very in a very calculating way to try and balance interest, even though uh, some of those interests are difficult to, to balance because of their dire need for resources, for investment, for capital, you know, for aid, and for, for kind of assistance that they need just to function as a state. Inflation is through the roof. Uh, joblessness is very high. The COVID has destroyed the already worst economy. And so its, it's actions re are much a reflection of the pain that the population and the government is feeling, as opposed to some kind of independent uh, policy that you'll have expected to get from Sudan about maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And so uh, whether it's its alliance uh, with uh, some certain Gulf countries or its uh, 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 restoration of diplomatic, that, that, that diplomatic relations, so to speak, with Israel, a lot of it has to do with its desire to be rehabilitated within the international system, to be assisted, and to be able to, uh, to be allowed to access uh, international financing and investment so they can be able to rebuild that country. Uh, let me now uh, raise some of the issues that uh, I read in the questions from the audience. So this question is uh, for the three of you, actually. Um, the question is, can the USA apply a new security order in the Red Sea region? Uh, maybe we can, uh, in, ex in a sense, um, broaden it a little bit and say something about US interests um, and activities um, in, in the region, it, it surprises me in a sense that uh, Washington has hardly been mentioned so far. Uh, you, uh, you know, it's, it's such a key strategic area. Uh, strategic area. Uh, we have mentioned s several countries. Um, we know that uh, the U.S. have a military presence there in Djibouti. Uh, but then I, I leave it to you to elaborate this further. Uh, Camille, do you want to start? Sure, thank you. Um, so very, very general question. Um, the, 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 I would say the, the, the problem for Washington at the moment is that there, there is a temptation to try to reduce their presence in the region or at least try to rethink how to, um, you know, 
be present, but in a way that is a bit smarter and using less uh, uh, less uh, economic and security capital in, in the region. Uh, and one temptation would be, and that is a bit dangerous, to try to outsource some of their uh, uh, you know, uh, security interests to the regional states and including to Gulf states, um, because they have been trying to engage more Gulf states in some of the regional issues, which is a good thing in itself. Um, so we've seen, for example, on the on the Grand Renaissance Dam uh, issue, they have tried to engage more with both states, with the Saudis and the Emirates, trying to see if they could, uh, um, you know, uh, provide some financial packages as part of a you know a more general uh, political uh, settlement. Uh, they have tried to also to see if the if the Emirates could uh, potentially uh, put pressure on the Eritreans uh, on the, on the current Tigray. Uh, uh, a crisis. So they're trying to engage, to engage uh, Gulf countries more in the region, which is a good thing. But at the same time, it's very important that the U.S. remains strongly present because they have this ability to uh, to um, this authority to uh, to 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 be uh, you know one of these uh, mediating powers in the region, and uh, um, and they should still be conscious of the fact that their uh, interests and their vision of what stability means still differs uh, uh, from, from the vision of, uh, of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And, uh, and they still have some important differences there. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's a complicated, I think, uh, 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 mix to, to find in, in the way to engage uh, Gulf states in, uh, in the Horn. Thank you, Camille. Uh, Brandon, Hassan, do you want to add something to this? Brandon? Yes. Uh, yeah, please. Um, thank you. Uh, this is going to cover a little bit of what Hassan said already in reference to the Russian military base. Um, so, look, the U.S. is a resident power in the region. There's no such thing as a new Red Sea order. Um, there's, over, there's close to 50,000 troops, U.S. troops in the Gulf region alone. You've got the 5th Fleet in Bahrain. You have the 6th Fleet, some of in the Mediterranean. Um, and so the U.S. is the dominant power in the region, even though um, the perception and to a degree the reality of troop drawdowns um, uh, has occurred. So removal of troops from Somalia, for example, there are about 700 by President Trump. Uh, they're now in Manda Bay in Kenya, just to the, uh, just to the south of Somalia. Um, removal of troops from Iraq, okay, uh, upcoming troop removal from Afghanistan, but it really doesn't change the balance of power much. Um, so, and I don't think there's much pressure to reduce um, the American presence in the region with the exception of these hot button places like Iraq and Afghanistan. I've never heard a conversation in Washington about a withdrawal from the Gulf, for example. Uh, and so I, I think that is something that probably needs to be placed in context. Um, and, and then the other thing is there's been a lot of hyperbole about these bases that uh, external, other external states have, whether it's the Russians who are going to build their logistics support center in Sudan, um, the Chinese base in Djibouti, which is frankly a little more worrisome, or the Turkish training facility in Mogadishu. Um, these are not really... Uh, power projection nodes in the way that uh, Al Udaid um, base is in, is in Qatar for the Americans, um, and so I think that this um, we've we've still maybe got a somewhat of a Cold War mentality where bases are uh, things that bristle with uh, missiles and tanks and troops, and you can project force into an, into the interior of a of a country or a region. I mean, that's just not the case uh, with any of these. And so the, the Red Sea order, um, whether it comes about through Saudi initiatives, Egyptian initiatives, Emirati initiatives, or something from, from the Horn itself, um, is going to be somewhat of, of, of a smaller player, if you will, albeit something that the U.S. might encourage. Um, Camille alluded to this, uh, certainly with, with, their, with Washington's actions with certain Gulf states. Um, but it's not going to necessarily be a game changer as far as distributions of power in the region. Brendan, Hassan, let me read you another of the questions that we have received. 
Um, what are the implications of terrorist groups' activities on the power competition in the region? Uh, how can they affect it? The, 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 the issue is, uh, I would say, are there connections between terrorist activities uh, in the Horn and um, external competition in the area? Can you see any? Can you tell us something about that? Yeah. Uh, to some degree, and uh, especially the competition um, between or uh, among Gulf countries, what we call uh, in this part of the world, uh, you know, the Gulf Cold War. Uh, the Gulf Cold War has had an effect of um, supporting uh, certain factions within countries that have actually turned either into terrorist groups or they were conducting terrorist activities in those countries, and particularly in Somalia. Um, a lot of uh, militias you find right now, they were supported by one part, either the, the Turkey Qatar Alliance or, or the Emirati, you know, Saudi Alliance. And, and, and so a, a lot of them have, uh, perhaps that was not the intention, but ultimately that was the effect, just like it happened in, in Syria. Now, the, the other challenge has been, of course, the war in Yemen and the kind of spillover effects it has on, on the Eastern Africa. So th this, this chain of, or stream of wars that have been taking place in large part also funneled by the competition that is going on because of the amount of money that is unaccounted for that has been coming into the Horn of Africa is a, a cause uh, to worry. And I think it's something that uh, has to be you know, addressed uh, because in the absence of that, it's going to be difficult. N just not too long ago, of course, we know that uh, 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 Eritrea was accused to be supporting terrorist groups in, inside Somalia. Of course, things are now changing because of the new administration or the outgoing administration of Armajo, which has been, you know, having a friend relations with Isai Safawaki of, of Eritrea. And so, yes, uh, that kind of, especially the Middle Eastern powers rivalry has contributed to that. But it is not so much about, let's say, the big power uh, rivalry between let's say, the Chinese and the Americans. I think that has had a uh, limited effect with regard to uh, the growth of terrorist groups. In fact, what it has actually done uh, is uh, the U.S. involvement has been robust, as uh, uh, Brandon just mentioned. Uh, in terms of uh, the power projection and balance of power within the region by the big powers has not fundamentally changed. What has changed is the perception uh, especially for the last four years of a hands-off approach by the United States. And that, of course, has taken something away from it in terms of its ability to mobilize. But going with a flurry of engagements by Joe Biden with uh, leaders in the region, uh, you know, lots of phone calls, some of them which we, you know, we, are, we are aware of, I think there is a renewed interest by the United States in the Horn of Africa, again, you know, to perhaps restore the place it had uh, during the Obama administration. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, I want to use um, our last minutes, may maybe with um, one minute for each of you, uh, to address uh, another question that has been raised, um, which is maybe, um, you know, I I'll leave it to you. Uh, how is the pandemic affecting the dynamics in the Red Sea region, if, if ever? Um, what could be the future of the region after the pandemic? Do Again, there, do you see um, an impact of the pandemic? I mean, of course, in individual societies, but can you see an impact on the evolution of relations be among countries in the region, or the presence of external countries in the Horn? Um, who wants to start? A very uh, quick answers, possibly, one minute each. Who wants to kick off? please. Um, I, I could go on for hours on this, but to, to say quickly, I would say from, from the Gulf perspective, I think the main thing is about, the main question is about with the, the you know, the, the financial hit that this crisis has been combined also with like the, the decrease of oil prices and this kind of, of issues. Um, the big question is to what extent they're going to have the financial ability to continue project power in the and influence in the area to the same extent that they have done in the past. Um, and, um, and the thing is that this reflection actually has been starting a bit before also the COVID crisis. So it's not necessarily 
directly linked to the to the climate crisis itself. There was already like some sort of reflections on because some of the investments that they have made in the region have not always uh, led to uh, either the economic um, profitability or the political uh, you know, uh, uh, reactions that they expected. And so uh, there might be a bit of recalibration on, on, on that sense. And, uh, and the COVID crisis is, is, is probably also going to, to limit the, the financial uh, uh, levers that they had uh, to, to have influence in the region. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, so to, to continue with, from um, Camille's answer, uh, yeah, I think you're, you're seeing um, the pandemic exacerbated uh, U.S.-China tensions. Um, you might see those play out a little more in the Red Sea region. Certainly what Hassan mentioned as far as a, um, the U.S. is back, uh, face of the Biden administration seems to be um, uh, having a, a limited effect um, for the time being, and certainly is the polar opposite of the absolutely hands-off um, uh, Trump administration for the past four years. Uh, where the Gulf states might um, come out uh, smelling quite quite good here, um, uh, particularly the UAE, I'll say, um, and I'll, I'll point directly to the UAE, um, is, is with vaccine diplomacy. Um, and so this might be something, this is cer certainly something they've been doing to multiple countries, I believe they, they, they will um, put this into effect uh, in the Horn of Africa. Um, they're producing Sinopharm vaccines here. So potentially in concert with China, vaccine diplomacy could play a role uh, in this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Hassan, uh, do you want to conclude by adding uh, something on this topic? Yeah, perhaps just a little, uh, since what I was gonna say has been said by my colleagues. Um, yeah, of course, uh, you know, COVID has changed the dynamic and uh, I think it has had a, a huge effect on international relations generally. Now, um, for African countries, I think Gulf countries, some of them have found an opportunity to be able to say, uh, to use, as uh, Brenton mentioned, uh, vaccine diplomacy. But beyond that, also some kind of uh, uh, financial support in terms of uh, rebuilding the economies that uh, post-pandemic is going to be critical in the, in the level of influence actually going to have on the region, on the Horn of Africa region, you know, by, by and large. I know outside that, I, when it comes to big powers, I don't see that changing uh, dramatically with, with regard to its effect on the Horn of Africa, but the Middle Eastern uh, countries, most certainly China, uh, it has exploited that for, uh, I would say, soft power purposes, and it's succeeding. Uh, to a considerable degree, but uh, it's not there yet. Thank you, Hassan. Um, I think we cannot but conclude that this is, a, this is really an extraordinarily uh, complex chessboard and a very complex area uh, with, with relations that are fast evolving uh, among regional and external powers. And, and I, uh, really thank you for helping us uh, trying to shed some light uh, on given our time constraints, of course, uh, on this um, very interesting, uh, challenging uh, area. Uh, so thanks to Brendan Cannon of Khalifa University, to Hassan Kanenje of the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies, and to Camille uh, Lons of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Thanks again. Thank you for, uh, to our audience. And um, I hope uh, we'll have uh, a future chances to hear from you about the evolution uh, of, of this uh, strategic area. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.